Hey Rayleigh and anybody else watching and welcome back to another message from your father. So 2 Samuel 10 through 12 today. We have been looking at a lot of different stuff, but we were looking at the ark moving to Jerusalem. We saw God not choosing David to build his temple. So we're going to see a different uh, a different builder for that temple. Beyond that, we also looked at David's prayers, his victories, and then his relationship with the last living relative of Saul's, that is Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. So we saw a bit of his relationship there, and we'll see more to come later on. Today is what many people have been waiting for, another incredibly famous story of David's, David and Bathsheba. We'll also see David's defeat of the Ammonites, and then Nathan, his rebuke of David. So again, all of this 10, 11, and 12 of 2 Samuel. So we will start at chapter 10. In the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died, and his son, Hanun, succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show kindness to Hanun, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanun concerning his father. When David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite nobles said to Hanun, their lord, do you think David is honoring your father by sending men to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanun seized David's men, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments in the, at the middle of the buttocks, and sent them away. When David was told about this, he sent messengers to meet the men, for they were greatly humiliated. The king said, Stay in Jericho until your beards have grown and then come back. When the Ammonites realized that they had become a stench in David's nostrils, they hired 20,000 Armenian foot soldiers from Beth Rehob and Zobah, as well as the king of Makkah, with a thousand men, and also 12,000 men from Tob. On hearing this, David sent Joab out with the entire army of fighting men. The Ammonites came out and drew up in battle formation at the entrance to their city gate, while the Armenians of Zobah and Rehob the men of Tob and Makkah were by themselves in the open country. Joab saw that they were in the battle lines in front of him and behind him. So he selected some of his best troops in Israel and he deployed them against the Armenians. He put the rest of the men under the command of Abishai, his brother, and deployed them against the Ammonites. Joab said, if the Armenians are too strong for me, then you come to my rescue. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come to rescue you. Be strong and let us fight bravely for our people and for the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is right or what is good in his sight. When Joab and the troops with him advanced to fight the Armenians and they fled before him, when the Ammonites saw that the Armenians were fleeing, they fled before Abishai and went inside the city. So Joab returned from fighting the Ammonites and came to Jerusalem. After the Armenians saw that they had been routed by Israel, they regrouped. Hadadezer had the Armenians brought from beyond the river, river that went to Halam, with Shobak, the commander of Hadadezer's army, leading them. When David was told this, he gathered all Israel, crossed the Jordan, and went to Halam. The Armenians forced their battle, or formed their battle lines to meet David and fought against him. But they fled before Israel, and David killed 700 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers. He also struck down Shobach, the commander of their army, and he died there. When all the kings who were vassals of Hadadezer saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they made peace with the Israelites and became subject to them. So the Armenians were afraid to help the Ammonites anymore. Chapter 11 In the spring, at the time that kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bath bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. 
and Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how, how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. When David was told Uriah did not go home, he just asked him, Haven't you just come from a distance? Why have you not go home? Go why did you not go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and all my lord's men are camped in open fields. How can I go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew was the strongest the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, When you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up, and he may ask you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Why didn't didn't you know that they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jero, Jero Besheth? Didn't a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, Also, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men, men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, say to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Chapter 12 The Lord sent to Nathan, da Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one ewe lamb he had brought, or he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did, a, he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then, Nathan said, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. 
Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went to his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood before him to get up, stood beside him to get up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him that his child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground, after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. His servants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that the child is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah. Meanwhile, Joab fought against Rabath of the Ammonites and captured the royal citadel. Joab, sent, Joab then sent messengers to David, saying, I have fought against Rabah and taken its water supply. Now muster the rest of the troops and besiege the city and capture it. Otherwise, I will take the city, and it will be named after me. So David mustered the entire army and went to Rabah and attacked and captured it. He took the crown from the head of their king, and its weight was a talent of gold, and it was set with precious stones, and it was placed on David's head. He took a great quantity of plunder from the city and brought out the people who were there, consigning them to labor with saws and with iron picks and axes, and he made them work at brickmaking. He did all this to the Ammonite towns. Then David and his entire army returned to Jerusalem. So that's a really sobering set of chapters. And I know David always gets put on this pedestal. And then this is the one, uh, one of the few examples that always gets brought up about David. And the, argue, the arg argument could be made that this started when David started taking more and more wives. The argument could be made that it started at many different points, but I think it's interesting that chapter 11 starts, and mind you, I know the chapters weren't initially written in the original manuscripts, but the chapter break here where it was originally created, again, after the manuscripts, is really interesting. So chapter 11, verse 1, seems to suggest that this is where it starts. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. And I don't know if you've heard that phrase, and I may not be saying it right, but idle hands are the devil's playground or, or workshop. Uh, it's, I think it's said a couple different ways. And where that originally comes from, some people say it's from the Bible, some people say it's from other areas, but I think there is some truth to that that if we're too idle, then problems can begin to arise. I've heard somebody say, always be about your father's business. Always be about God's business, his kingdom. And I think there is so, so, so much truth to that. It's so important to make sure that we are staying busy with one thing or another. And this is coming from someone who is far too lazy, but recognizing that the dangers in that can be great. If David went off to war it's very, very likely that this situation would have never played out. If it did play out in some manner, it would be very, very different. But David should have been to war. Very likely he should have been at war. Now, the Bible doesn't explicitly say why he wasn't, but it's just something to make note of. So my prayer for you, Rayleigh, is that you would be about your father's business, that you would always be seeking to serve his kingdom. And that's not always easy but it is always, always important.
Anyway, know that I fully support you and I love you so, so much. And I'm praying for you like crazy. And uh, yeah, anyone else watching as well know that I love you and I appreciate you so much as well. And I'll plan on seeing you tomorrow. Have a good one.